Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Atkinson. I'm a professor of environmental humanities at the University of Washington in Bothell, where I have been teaching a seminar on climate grief and eco anxiety, as well as other climate emotions uh, like hope and courage for the past seven years. So in this lecture, I'm going to talk a little about the emotional toll of our climate crisis, as well as tools that you can use to avoid burnout and overcome despair. But from the outside, I, I want to clarify that this talk is really about harnessing or channeling dark emotions into collective action. It is not about eliminating them, because ultimately, grief, anger, sadness, um, these can be healthy and appropriate responses to climate destruction and biodiversity loss and the unprecedented harm unfolding around us. Uh, it's true that we don't want those emotions to hijack us and derail our mental health, but at the same time, we do need to honor them and recognize that they have an important part to play in this story. So the question I want to ask for today is, you know, what would happen if we reframed climate anxiety or climate grief as a moral emotion, as a sign of compassion and connection to our world? how might that reframe this thing that we imagined as an obstacle into a, a doorway towards meaningful renewal of our planet um, and as something that actually motivates us to fight for what we love. So this talk is essentially about seeing grief, anxiety, and other dark emotions as our allies. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, um, so I just wanna start with a, a quick summary of the emotional dimensions of our climate crisis. Uh, focusing on how climate impacts our emotional landscape is not something that we've traditionally done in mainstream climate discussions. You know, We tend to talk about physical damage rather than internal harm. And that's partly because for the past few decades, we've primarily treated climates, uh, the, the climate story as a science story. Um, of course, scientists have been the main communicators during that time. So we've talked about planetary destruction using statistics and graphs and numerical equations. And this is not at all to disparage scientists. Of course, numbers are just the language of their discipline. But that quantitative approach um, or that quantitative language isn't the best framework for acknowledging this deep and often unconscious grief that comes from living in an era where so much life and beauty are being destroyed. And I myself started paying attention to this after seeing my own students struggling with the heartbreak of climate loss going back about a decade ago. Um, and to be frank, I was dealing with a lot of climate grief myself uh, this slide here shows some quotes from my students, and, and this is from the first day of a class where I asked them, how do you feel about the future? Um, one of them here says, I feel hopeless, useless, and minuscule. Another, why even bother bringing children into an already dying world? Another says, seeing the planet break down has made me break down, and this goes on and on. And I think the reason that this is a problem is not just that young people are suffering, you know, of course we we don't want that, but also from a practical standpoint, research shows that fear, despair, and chronic anxiety um, are a huge impediment to creative thinking and problem solving. And those are exactly the skills that we need for climate solutions. And as an educator, I see this playing out in live time where students will sometimes tell me that they wanna drop out of environmental majors because the material is so depressing. And data show that this actually is a global phenomenon. Uh, about three years ago, The Lancet published the largest research study ever done on mental health impacts of climate among young people. Uh, this was taken from 10,000 teens from across the world Brazil, Phil the Philippines, Finland, Nigeria, the US, India, Australia, and, and several other countries. 56% um, of youth said that they believe that humanity is doomed. 45% said that climate anxiety was disrupting day-to-day -day activities like 
focusing on school or sleeping or just trying to enjoy themselves, um, spending time with friends. One in four said they were afraid to have children and 77% characterized our climate future as frightening. So the injustice here is that our failure to act on climate change is robbing young people, not just of ecological stability, but also of their personal joy and well-being. Um, so the, the authors of this study use the language of moral injury to describe this loss of young people's sense of hope in their own future. But this emotional distress probably feels familiar to everyone these days. It, it's not just young people. It's also activists, scientists, parents, you know, people who love birds or snow. You could be a farmer. Um, it's just someone who's outraged about the health of, of frontline communities. So however we look at this, uh, the, the psychological fallout of climate change, we, we see that the climate crisis is driving a crisis of well-being. But a really important point I want to make today is that that's not the end of the story, um, because this is not just a one-way relation where climate impacts mental health alone. The reverse is also true. Um, I have a book coming out this spring uh, called An Existential Toolkit for Climate Justice Educators, where we explore um, emotional tenacity as one of the biggest predictors of whether people will stay engaged over the long haul, especially in the face of setbacks or, or situations that seem overwhelming. So while I acknowledge that many people may see this focus on emotional response as a way of retreating from social and political change, that inner resilience is precisely what equips us to do the work of addressing the structural conditions driving climate upheavals in the first place. And so this is where the story becomes really empowering because each one of us does have the agency to cultivate those inner tools. And as it turns out, uh, the same message is also now coming from the IPCC, which recently recommended what they call an inner transition to create the conditions for the kind of social revolution that our planet needs. And as we write in the introduction of the book, emotions, values, mindsets, the psyche and matters of the heart are the new solar panels, technologies required to set into motion extant solutions and public will. Okay, so before I move on to listing um, those steps for building resilience, I want to first identify two really unhelpful but very common binaries in our thinking about climate change. Um, these are kind of reductive mindsets that tend to split our emotional responses into mutually exclusive camps. And that can end up limiting our imagination and obscuring our understanding of both the potential value and the potential drawbacks of different emotional responses. So the first false binary in this division um, is, or the first false binary is the division between love and grief, uh, or it's also sometimes framed as an opposition between hope and despair. We tend to think of grief and despair as a sign that something is wrong with us, um, like a deficit that needs to be fixed. But grief actually arises from love and attachment. Uh, you will not grieve for something you don't love. So grief is not something that needs to be fixed. In fact, when we feel the pain of loss, we remember that our existence and well-being are, are deeply entwined with other lives. So grief is an expression of empathy with other species or other people, and it's a way of honoring our connection with them. Malkia Devich Cyril has one of the best responses to this. Um, she says, joy is not the opposite of grief. Grief is the opposite of indifference. Grief is an evolutionary indicator of love, the kind of great love that guides revolutionaries. Unfortunately, we, we often get the opposite message from our culture, which is very grief phobic uh, and tells us, you know, stay positive, cheer up those messages can really make us worry that if we allow ourselves to feel our own grief, we'll get pulled down into a pit of despair where we can never pull ourselves back out again. Um, another concern you hear from people within the climate movement itself is that 
this situation is so urgent, we just don't have time to dwell on our feelings. And that really pushes us to, to rush past our own emotional needs and jump straight into action. Now, the problem with this is when we skip that in-between step of, of processing the emotional toll of all of this lost beauty in life, we're really bypassing the very insight that motivates us to fight for our world in the first place. We should never equate grief with inaction. In fact, if we remember that grief and love are really two sides of the same coin, we can see them as allies in our work towards climate justice. And, you know, I think many people would already agree that love is perhaps the most powerful motivator to fight for what we want to save. And if grief is the pain of losing what we love or anticipating that loss, then both of those emotions are already at work in deepening our commitment to what matters most. So we might even think of grief as an alarm system that is alerting us to pay attention when what we cherish is at risk. So from that perspective, you know, that grief love pairing can really be harnessed to rouse ourselves into action. Then the, the second false binary we see in thinking about climate emotions is the opposition between denial and doom. On the, on the one side, we have denial, uh, which is dismissing or turning away from the problem. Uh, it's not real or it's not that bad. Then on the other side, you have doomers who say it's all too real. And in fact, it's so bad that we're screwed. It's too late, et cetera. And I mention this because a lot of climate scientists and activists are now arguing that the public really jumped from denial to doom almost overnight, especially here um, in the United States. And that that has become the new big obstacle to motivating people. So we used to have an action because the problem was too remote. Now we have an action because it seems too inescapable and overwhelming. And when we decide that it's too late, that really becomes its own self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, the fossil fuel industry really benefits from the rhetoric of doom because if our efforts are pointless, then you know we might as well just keep going on with business as usual and enjoy the party while we can, right? I think however you look at it, doom is a psychology of helplessness and it's taking over just at the moment when our efforts matter the most in deciding how quickly and decisively we're gonna reduce more harm going forward. And for me, this was really hard to kind of wrap my head around initially, but I think it makes more sense as explained by psychologists like Leslie Davenport, who identify both of these mindsets, denial and doom, as a basic psychic defense against the human discomfort with uncertainty and ambiguity. So she explains that we don't like to be in an in-between state where we're unsure what's going to happen. And while that sometimes leads to disavowal and turning away, other people go, go towards doom, right? It's too late. We can't do anything. And as Davenport says, quote, paradoxically, moving to either one of those places provides a kind of psychological relief. And that's because, number one, it excuses us from acting. And two, it gets us out of that really uncomfortable gray zone where we're suspended between multiple possible outcomes where we don't know how the story's gonna end and we have to live with that ambivalence. That is unsettling. And our brains don't like uncertainty. At least with doom, you know what to expect, right? Um, but building emotional resilience is exactly what equips us to stay present with uncertainty rather than retreating from it. So that brings me to this checklist for coping. Um, and many of these points are taken from the book I mentioned uh, that I co-edited, The Existential Toolkit for Climate Justice Educators, there are 35 contributors to this book. So this comes from experts in mental health, in activism, science, arts, humanities, um, and it offers dozens and dozens of tools. Um, but despite all of that diversity and variation, there really are five common themes that run across all sections of the book. Number one um, is simply acknowledging and making space to talk about emotional responses to climate upheaval. Uh, 
The most obvious benefit is that acknowledgement is the first step out of repression. And I think we all know repression is bad for us, of course. Um, but this really is a little trickier than it even appears at first glance. Um, a huge part of people's depression and anxiety actually come from feeling alone and isolated. And when you look at surveys of people who are suffering from climate grief and despair, they often say that they think that nobody else is as scared or distressed as they are. And this can make us feel either deviant or like everyone else around us is, is criminally indifferent to the end of the world. And not only is that a very lonely place to be on a personal level, but it is also politically demotivating. People who feel isolated are much less empowered to take action. But when we openly acknowledge these emotional responses, we quickly find out how absolutely widespread these feelings are. And that counteracts isolation and creates a sense of solidarity. So these here are quotes from those same sets of students, um, but I took this at the very end of our seminar, highlighting how that feeling of community itself was the single most helpful tool that they gained. A second reason I'll mention that acknowledgement is so crucial is simply because our culture doesn't really have um, established norms for recognizing or for mourning the loss of nature. And that's a problem insofar as mourning is a social process. If you feel grief for the disappearance of snow on the mountains behind your town or for the death of millions of animals in a wildfire, there really aren't any established social structures to acknowledge it. And this is known as disenfranchised grief, uh, a kind of pain that's essentially made invisible, which deepens the harm that we experience. And naming and acknowledging that distress creates connection and lightens the burden. Then the second tool involves reframing. And I've already talked about how we might do this with grief, but there are many other areas where we can recognize a, a perceived deficit as something that may actually be empowering for us. So I mentioned how we should think of eco-anxiety as a moral emotion, and of course, reject any framing that suggests that eco-anxiety is a dysfunction or you know, some sort of mental illness. Um, that just locates the problem in the individual instead of the social structure. Climate anxiety, as I've mentioned, comes from a sense of compassion and a desire for justice. So remember that when you're feeling distress. And also, if someone you know is struggling with one of these dark emotions, see if you can help them recognize their response as a sign of emotional engagement. So for example, if someone feels anger and outrage, that arises from a refusal to accept injustice. If someone feels shame, uh, that can be a pathway towards taking responsibility and working to correct the harm that we're contributing to. If we feel de destabilized by uncertainty, maybe that same uncertainty can be seen as possibility, the very condition where creativity and renewal become possible, and so on. Then step number three is to rewrite the story. Humans live their lives by stories, uh, whether we're trying to make sense of who we are, uh, what kind of world we want, if we're trying to envision the future, we do all of that through stories. So be aware of the kinds of narratives that you are consuming. Most information about the state of our planet comes from the media. And research shows that 85% of environmental news is told in the negative frame. And it is deliberately designed that way. Um, we all know that the, the news is a profit-driven enterprise, so it can't survive if we don't click on those headlines. And that means, of course, that the, the sensational or the violent stories are going to get more play than the you know, understated, undramatic stories of long-term community change and behind the scenes work of generating solutions. It's also crucial to be aware of the addictive nature of those catastrophic stories and how they keep us coming back for more. Brain scans show this, um, that, that people actually get a dopamine hit every time they check back and, and, and get the latest update on their device. But the cumulative effect is a perception that we're living in an apocalypse. 
And you might think for yourself about, you know, all the times that you've gotten swept into a doom scrolling loop, whether it's during an election cycle or some disaster where you just can't stop checking and refreshing. And you even feel vulnerable when you fall out of the loop because we are hardwired to think that monitoring every development is what keeps us safe. And I would say, to be fair, media corporations didn't create this bias in our brains. What they're doing really is exploiting and amplifying something that's already part of our psychology. Uh, psychologists call this the negativity bias, where even if our minds see an equal amount of good and bad information, our minds are actually evolved to latch onto the bad stuff. And of course, while that might be advantageous in a world of saber-toothed tigers and poisonous snakes, where you know having a brain that's hyper aware of potential threats is a very useful survival adaptation. Um, in today's world, where we're bombarded 24 seven with images of every bad thing that's happening in every corner of the world. And it's like this fire hose coming at us through screens that you know we are glued to from morning till night. Even when you're asleep, that phone is on your pillow so that the moment you wake up, you get updated on the latest catastrophe. Our nervous systems are not built to tolerate that relentless stress. And research shows how it leads to chronic psychological effects that really wear down mental health over time. So I wanna be clear, I am not advocating that we sugarcoat reality or hide from bad news. I read the bad news as well. <laughs> but if we want to, to build resilience um, and the planet needs us to build that resilience, then just being consciously aware that the media is actively manipulating our negativity bias, that is a crucial first step. And more importantly, it creates an opening to recognize that those catastrophic stories are just one version of reality. There is a whole universe of empowering stories that are happening at the same time as the bad stuff. These are coming from countless people engaged in change in every part of the world, whether we're talking about schools or social justice movements, financial markets, energy, agriculture, youth movements, um, you know, just because the media is underreporting those solution-based stories doesn't mean they're any less real. Um, I, I admit it can take work to actively seek out positive news, but one shortcut I would recommend is to sub subscribe to groups that aggregate those solution-based stories for you. So for example, one that I subscribe to is Fix, which is published by Grist. Uh, and Grist also has a solutions section of their website that reports weekly on positive developments around the world. So you have good climate news that's happening every week, but you wouldn't know it um, unless you get a group like this, maybe that will send it directly to your inbox. Um, there's also the Solutions Journalism Network. It's a consortium that reports on solutions to problems across the spectrum. So it's not just climate. Um, their goal, it, it's, it's not to avoid the bad news. They will still tell that part, but what they emphasize is how people are responding. And that is the part that is missing from those mainstream accounts. So the idea really is, it's not just to make us feel good, but also to provide a template for interventions that have worked in one context so we can apply them in others. And, you know, you, you might think that, well, this is just another way of indulging in wishful thinking and, and soothing ourselves with, with hope as the world burns down. Um, but I, and I do want to address that misgiving head on. And that, that leads to my last point under step number three here. Stories really do have tangible and powerful implications for the kind of future that we're gonna create. When we talk about the future, whether in science fiction or Hollywood film or mainstream news, the dominant genre we use is apocalypse. And this creates a perception that our existing political and economic um, structures are inevitable because we rarely see any alternatives. And how can you imagine a future that looks different and better if you never see anything like that represented? I really like the way that Joanna Macy frames this when she outlines the three dominant stories currently competing to define our moment. She says the first story is the business as usual story, which tells us that with more economic growth and technology and free market solutions, we'll eventually get to prosperity for all. So this story wants us to stay the course. 
The second story is the story of the Great Unraveling, which predicts social and ecological collapse, mass extinction, conflict over resources. Um, you're probably familiar with this one because it's the dominant narrative of the climate movement. And then the third story is what Macy calls the Great Turning, which sees in our current moment the possibility of profound social transformation towards genuine sustainability and environmental justice. And Macy says, the point is not to argue over which of these three stories is correct, since they are all happening. Instead, she says, the question is, which one do we invest in? And as she writes in that box at the bottom, um, that third story of transition, healing, and recovery is where you will turn when you acknowledge that the first story is leading us to catastrophe, but you refuse to let the second story have the last word. Okay, tool number four then is to connect. And I already noted under step number one, acknowledging and, and talking openly about eco grief is it's already a way of connecting and building community. Um, but to do that, we need to seek out and find others who share our concern. If you're unsure where to find that connection, uh, you can find a list on the resources page of my website. Uh, so it's drjenniferatkinson.com. Um, if you go to the resources page, there are groups that meet virtually that I've listed there. There are also groups that meet in person and all of them are really built around having discussions around eco-anxiety and, and you know, emotional responses more generally. The Climate Courage Workshop is um, really wonderful because it's so international and you can log into a call and, and talk to people from around the world who are dealing with um, responses very similar probably to your own, as well as um, ones that are very distinctive to where they live and, and what they're responding to. Um, the Good Grief Network is another group that's fantastic. It's a 12-step program. Um, and there are chapters all over all over the US as well as the world. There are also climate cafes that you can find throughout the country. Um, one way to look for them is, is just to search online by typing your city plus climate cafe. And for all of these options, the groups, um, they'll also give you templates and instructions to, to facilitate a group in your own community if one doesn't yet exist. And then the final step here, number five, is to get engaged and take action. When I talk to people about my work, the single most common question I get is, what gives you hope? And my answer is always the same. Don't get fixated on cultivating hope. Hope will come if you do the work. But just as important is doing that work as part of a collective movement. If we stay isolated in our personal bubble trying to, you know, achieve a zero waste lifestyle all alone, that is a recipe for disillusionment because one person alone can never go far enough to change the equation by, you know, reducing your carbon footprint or whatever approach you're going to take here. Um, not only is that ineffective, but you also end up in a place where you feel that any effort you make is just pointless or insignificant when measured against the scale of the crisis. This is what psychologists call the drop in the bucket imaginary. And we see it all around us, right? People throwing up their hands saying, what's the point? But if you're part of a larger team, if you're contributing to a greater movement for widespread social change, then you leverage that collective power and you start to see how all of our individual contributions add up to a larger network of change. Um, not only that, but when we take action in solidarity and when we see ourselves as part of a team, we, we gain a greater sense of purpose, which counteracts the existential loneliness that has become a modern crisis of its own alongside the, the climate crisis. So this is actually good news because it means that the solution to our sense of despair and loneliness and the solution to climate change turn out to be the same. They both lie in collective action. In fact, research shows um, that often the source of our despair isn't the crisis itself, so much as a longing for a sense of purpose and the absence of fellowship in the midst of, of really hard times. So if we're working with others to address climate change and taking on one of the, the greatest challenges in human history, 
being a part of a global movement to, to create a better world and contributing to actually preserving the life support systems of this planet. I mean, what could possibly be more meaningful than that? For me, it's always called to mind the question that that Mary, uh, Mary Oliver, who's a poet, asks where she says, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What does the answer to that question look like for you? So that wraps up my talk. Um, my website, which is in that yellow box at the top, dranniferatkinson.com, also lists a, a lot of further readings and resources. Um, a lot of the stuff that I, I just mentioned in my talk um, is available there if you want to learn more. Um, I would also encourage you to look out for my new book, An Existential Toolkit for Climate Justice Educators. I've co-edited this with the brilliant Sarah Jaquette Ray. And as I mentioned, um, it features 35 really insightful scholars and activists who integrate climate emotions into their teaching and work. Um, I hope that it helps in addition to the points that I shared in this talk. Uh, and I wanna thank you very much for listening today.